The following episode contains difficult subject matter. Please take care while listening. I'm Kathleen Goldhar. This is Crime Story. Every week, a new crime with the storyteller who knows it best. For 17 years, America has been terrorized by the man known as the Unabomber. A fanatical quest to kill and maim and frighten, all in the name of ridding society of technology. He's going to punish the wrongdoers. He's going to set the world right. His trademark is his handmade bombs, beautifully crafted and designed to kill horribly. Federal agents have taken into custody a man they suspect as the Unabomber. On April 3rd, 1996, a swarm of FBI agents descended upon a small cabin in rural Montana. Inside, they found Ted Kaczynski, a Harvard mathematician turned fugitive, who had been terrorizing the country with his homemade bombs for nearly two decades. He became known as the Unabomber. In the years since Kaczynski's capture, there has been an endless churn of movies, TV shows, and documentaries trying to unpack his unique psychology. There's even a university archive that houses his complete works, 79 boxes of notes and scribbles and insights into the man himself. Was he a genius led astray, a madman who murdered in cold blood, Or was he a prophet whose anti-technology manifesto foresaw the decline of humanity? A few years ago, journalist Eric Benson began wondering about all of this, too. His long investigation resulted in a podcast called Project Unibom. So let's start with the crimes. Let's go back to the spring of 1978. He sends his first bomb. Who was his intended target? So his intended target was an engineering professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic University named E.J. Smith, which is an odd first target. Ted Kaczynski did not know E.J. Smith. E.J. Smith was not a famous person. I think it was literally a name he pulled out of a book, uh, a a kind of directory. And E.J. Smith was targeted simply because he was someone who was involved in the advance of science, engineering, math, the kind of numbers parts of human knowledge. Um, But the bomb never made it to E.J. Smith. The one through line of the story is Ted consistently became a better bomber and a kind of more effective terrorist as he went on. It's a story really of what happens when a guy doesn't get caught he could totally have been caught after the first bombing. He was, kind, in fact, kind of lucky that he wasn't caught. And so this whole story could have been a total nothing burger. It's about a guy who made a crappy bomb that he tried to put into a mail slot and it was too big. And so he ended up just leaving it in a parking lot, hoping that some random person who was involved in the sciences at the Illinois Institute of Technology would pick it up and blow themselves up. Instead, it got returned to the name that was on the return address, which was just another totally random professor in the sciences at Northwestern University, just north of Chicago. And it was the the professor got it. He knew he hadn't sent the package. He called up the university security. The guy opened it, thought it might have been a firecracker, had very kind of minor injuries, like was singed a little on his hand. And that bomb, like it, it was not mentioned in the papers. You know, it was just it was like a total non-event. And then from there, it just, you know, escalates to the point where his bombs are international news and are killing people. And he's freezing an entire country when he makes a threat that he's going to blow up an airplane out of Los Angeles airport in 1995. One of the things you report in the podcast is something that obviously I had never heard about before, but nobody had ever heard about before with those addresses and the return address. Somehow the police start to suspect a whole other group of people, right? Can you tell me about who they actually suspected sent that bomb? Yeah, that was that was my little pet project within within Project Unabomber. It was great. When you read about the Unabomber, 
so much of the story is weighted toward the end of the Unabom campaign. So it was it was 18 years from the first bomb until his arrest in 1996. But this wasn't in the news in any way until 1993, kind of really kind of national news. The term Unabomber didn't get coined until 1993 also. The investigation, the FBI's kind of official name for the investigation was Unibomb, University and Airline Bomber. And you can see it when you look through the news archives in 93, he goes from being the Unibomb bomber. And then I don't know who it was, but at some point someone was like, Let, let's just squish these together and call him the Unibomber. In all of these accounts, there's a brief mention that some of the suspects at one point were Dungeons and Dragons players in Chicago. And I kind of made it my business to track down that story and kind of figure out what it was because it seemed so interesting and kind of wild and also very much of that era. This kind of satanic panic, Dungeons and Dragons is dangerous. I've read kind of these things in other stories where people become suspects because they play the wrong role playing games. Um, it got started because there happened to be a guy who was a student of E.J. Smith at Rensselaer Polytechnic University, whose mother was also a secretary for Buckley Christ, the professor at Northwestern. So there was one person who had a link to both of the names on this package totally randomly, like a gazillion in one chance. Ted Kaczynski had really no idea who either of these people were, but just in linking them, there was one person who actually did know who both of them were. And that was this college student, this guy named Greg. And through Greg, the investigation widened to this entire kind of friend group that met at Northwestern University and played war games, played Dungeons and Dragons, played other things. And they remained suspects really up until the end. How did it affect their lives? I think it's really, it's a story about kind of what the pressure of being under investigation does to a group of people. That there are all these young guys in their early to mid 20s and law enforcement, the FBI, the ATF is pulling them aside and saying, either we know you did it, you're going to tell us, or we know that someone in your group did it. You're going to, who do you think it could be? And so there's this kind of paranoia that sets in and the group starts to suspect that the FBI and the ATF and the U.S. Postal Service, which are the three entities kind of investigating this, were right. And that one of them actually was responsible for these bombings, which are continuing. And it kind of comes to a head when there's one particular member of the group, this guy, Dave White, who becomes totally convinced that another member of the group, this guy, Jeff Ward, is the bomber. And it goes to extremes where he sees Jeff has written out the lyrics to John Prine's song, Sweet Revenge. I got kicked off of Noah's Ark. I turned my cheek and Dave is making these connections between lyrics in the song and the locations and targets of the bombings, uh, as if Jeff has kind of planned out the entire Unibomb campaign to sync up with the lyrics of this one song which sounds ridiculous, but you can kind of see, I think part of the appeal to me of that story is you can kind of see if like the, your, the pressure is great enough, you're looking for clues and you find these things and you say, aha, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the guy who, who does it. I'm going to, I'm going to end the Unabomb campaign. I'm going to find him. And you start to see like when that John Prine, when you read out the John Prine lyrics, I was like, sure, if you're suspicious, and you see a guy has decided to write out lyrics for whatever reason that is, I can understand how you would sort of let yourself fall into the beliefs. You start to see what you want to believe. Totally. I mean, look, yeah, interpreting cryptic lyrics of a song, I mean, you could, there's so many different interpretations. So the whole time that they're paying attention to these college students, Ted Kaczynski is actually left on his own devices to continue to develop. Tell me what sort of happens to him over those years. How does he evolve? So the the overarching story of the of him as a terrorist over the like the 17 years that he pursued the bombings is he continues to get better at doing bombs. He was a math professor. He has a scientific mind. He is kind of doing experiments from his house in the woods, figuring out how to build the bombs better. And he's keeping meticulous notes, scientific reports. Sometimes he's writing them in Spanish 
because he's learning Spanish, so he's practicing Spanish. He's iterating, he's building technology. This one kind of mad inventor in the woods is figuring out how to go from this kind of matchstick bomb to this sort of more plastic explosive that he is building by the end that is like t a totally devastating weapon. The other part is that he is a human being. And during that time, there are these moments of kind of doubt and moments where he becomes kind of fixated on a different life. You know, at one point, someone sees him plant a bomb at a computer store in Salt Lake City. And after that moment, he stops bombing for seven years. And during those seven years, he does things like he applies to go back to college to study journalism, actually, which is like totally mind-blowing because like, <laughs> Ted like hates journalists or came to hate journalists. But he applied, there's a guy who graduated from Harvard, had a PhD in mathematics from the University of Michigan, was on a tenure track at the University of Berkeley. And he applies in his late 40s to go back to be an undergraduate in a journalism program at the University of Montana. He's accepted and he just pulls out right before he's going to go. He starts seeing a psychologist. Also, Ted hates psychology that kind of science of mind. He's really resentful of it. David, his brother, has a relationship with a, a, a Mexican migrant laborer in Texas where David lives. Ted strikes up this long kind of pen pal correspondence with this guy. He's learning Spanish. He's talking about how he wants to come down to visit David and meet him. He never does. So there are all these points where it's like he takes his eye off the ball of being a murderer and a terrorist and trying to bring down technology to just kind of live, which I guess is what happens when you're left alone for 18 years to do this thing. It develops its own rhythm. When do the police or the authority, the FBI, start to kind of connect the dots and start to think that this might be one person? In terms of when the police connected the dots on the sort of lone wolf terrorist, I think that was always a, a significant theory. They just, but they didn't, they didn't know anything. They would pursue a suspect and then it would wash out. You know, it's true that the, the Dungeons and Dragons group, they were very serious suspects and certainly like individuals in that group were very serious suspects until the end. But there were tons of other suspects that would kind of come through. You know, someone would sort of rise to the top and then they would look at where they were at the various times the bombs were either placed or mailed because they knew where the bombs had been mailed. And some of the, the bombs were were not just mailed. They were Ted actually put them somewhere. And so the you know people would get washed out pretty quickly there. Ah, okay, no, he wasn't in, he wasn't in Salt Lake City. You know, in February of 1987, he was in Toronto. Oh, guess it's not the Unabomber. And there were all these different profiles of who it could be. Some ended up being pretty close to Ted. Another kind of big theory was that it was someone in the airline industry, that it was a mechanic, that it was someone who was blue collar. So. They, they didn't really know. I, I think, the, I think the, the honest answer is when did they know that there was one person who sent the bombings? It was when they became convinced Ted Kaczynski was the Unabomber. And that kind of blew open with his manifesto, right? It blew open after the publication of his manifesto. Yeah. So his manifesto was published in September of 1995. The, the bombings are the kind of big events of this story. But in a way, the manifesto is the biggest you know, I don't if there was no manifesto, if there were no library at the University of Michigan with his papers, I don't think I would have done this story. To me, it's like the what's interesting about Ted Kaczynski is that this is a murderer and a terrorist who also has a university archive where his ideas are kind of presented and taken as seriously as any other ideas that are in the archive. And he the thing that he did after his last bomb was he had written this 35,000 word anti-technology manifesto and he coerced the Washington Post into publishing it in every edition of their newspaper. I actually remember when the Washington Post did publish that manifesto and what a big splash it was. Can you just remind us what was the gist of the manifesto? Ted is saying that technological progress uh, has been, in his words, a disaster for the human race. And Part of that is what I think a lot of us would think of, uh, which is sort of environmental. But it's actually not a very big part of the manifesto. Like Ted has been embraced by a certain kind of radical eco-thinker. 
but it's actually that's not very much in the manifesto at all. He barely mentions nature. I think wild nature is mentioned once, which is how he referred to kind of wilderness. Really what the manifesto is about is that technological progress has kind of divorced us from what it means to be human, essentially, that has made us alienated, miserable, anxious. And that's really kind of Ted's central argument. What technology has done to us has been bad in every way. And that the only way that we're going to reverse that is to destroy technology, is to go back living how we used to live. How did the Washington Post even get the manifesto to start with? His goal was that he wanted to get a big audience for his writing. And so he sent it to the New York Times, sent it to the Washington Post. Uh, he actually sent it to Penthouse magazine as well. Uh, and he had all of these very Ted-like kind of stipulations. Ted is like, to the end, very into kind of legal fine print of everything from the way he talks to his parents to the way he's presenting his terms to the world through the manifesto. And he said, if the New York Times and Washington Post publish it, you know, I will stop trying to kill people with my bombs. I will you know, retain the right to send a bomb out for purposes of sabotage. Uh, and also, I'm going to write follow-ups, one follow-up a year for the next three years. And you have to publish those two, or the terms of this agreement will be violated. And if the Times and the Washington Post had declined to publish it and Penthouse published it, uh, I think he would retain the right to kill one more person. Uh, <laughs> so the Times and the Post both get this manifesto. And he gives them three months to publish it. So the clock is ticking and they have to decide what they're going to do. Are they going to give in to his demands? And are they going to give in to his demands, trusting his word that if they publish this, he's going to stop killing people? And what sort of precedent are they going to set by doing that? Is this going to open the door for anyone to make a kind of threat that, oh, I'm going, if you don't publish my story about this, I'm going to kill someone, or I'm going to bomb this, or I'm going to do this other horrible thing. Uh, and they, I think, agonize about it, about what they're going to do. And they think about the decision themselves. They consult with the FBI and the Department of Justice, and they eventually come to the conclusion that they're going to do it, that they're going to publish the manifesto, put it out there. And I think from the newspaper's perspective, what they told me what Don Graham and Len Downey, who were the publisher and the, the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post, told me is, I think, the possibility that this could end the killings, that this would save lives. That, I think, was their big thing. When I talked to the FBI team that was really kind of pushing this, they said, well, we recommended this because we thought this was a clue that should be out there for the public. That if you put it in every edition of the Washington Post, if this is international news, if people are reading it around the world, maybe someone is going to read this manifesto and say, huh, that sort of sounds like my brother. And that's exactly what happened. And they got tons and tons and tons of tips from people saying, this sounds like my ex. This sounds like my brother. This sounds like my crotchety neighbor who's always like shaking his fist when we're playing music too loud. And they kind of filter through those and chase down those tips for, for months and months and months. And then when they've kind of given up hope that this actually was going to yield something, they hear from what will turn out to be David Kaczynski, that there's this guy in Montana who might have written it. You end up talking to David, and he's such a sympathetic, interesting person. How torturous was that for him? I, I think it, it, you know, he describes the process of turning in his brother as this devil's dilemma. I think it was just an excruciating process. They were very close, um, but Ted had kept rebuffing David um, when David had sort of strayed from the path that Ted had set forth. 
David is, I think, seven or eight years younger than Ted. And in a lot of ways, their lives were parallel up to a certain point. Ted quit academia, moved to Montana, built this shack on a property that actually he and David co-owned for a long period of time. Also, David went to you know an Ivy League college. He went to, he went to Columbia University. And instead of going off and becoming a lawyer or a doctor or any of the things that David totally would have been capable of becoming, he worked in a factory in Montana and then himself kind of ended up living in super austere isolation in the high desert of Texas in the Big Bend region. Um, and so for a while, these kind of guys were synced up and then David had a romantic relationship and that kind of pulled him out from isolation into society. And he and Ted, because of Ted, you know, they had this schism. Ted kind of cast him off, said that he was, you know, he was no longer going to talk to him, that what David was pursuing was against everything that Ted and David had believed. And so by the time David reads the manifesto, Ted is this brother who he was extremely close to, who he hasn't really had any meaningful contact with in nearly a decade because of this this relationship. I think David is someone who feels very deeply. I think not only was David the closest person to Ted, but vice versa, because they lived in such isolation. So before David met his wife or kind of reconnected, they'd known each other for a long time, uh, before Linda was a kind of daily presence in his life, I think David would have said Ted was his best friend. And David had a lot of concerns about Ted. He thought that Ted was likely suffering from mental illness. He thought that Ted, if law enforcement came around, might take his own life, might go down, you know, guns blazing. And so it was just this very delicate situation of, I, you know, I love my brother. Uh, I care about my brother. I think my brother is someone I kind of need to take care of. And then I also think my brother is killing people and I recognize that I have to stop that. So I think it was even more complicated than a normal kind of if, you know, if, if you had a, a more kind of functional relationship with your brother, the fact that David had this caretaker feeling of responsibility for Ted, and then he was going to be the one to set Ted on a path toward either life in prison or the death penalty. You know, it was was really excruciating. Did you gleam anything from their early life that gave you a better sense of both? I'm interested in the both brothers sort of deciding at some point to go live off the grid and be these isolationists, but then also Ted's own veering into violence. Is there anything in their in Ted's early life that gives you a sense of how that happened? Yes, it's totally the question you want to ask, right? Like so many people have asked me like, well, man, what were those parents up to? Yeah. <laughs> like what were you know, their, their two sons like end up living in total isolation, swearing off society. And then there's this dynamic of like David is a Buddhist, vegetarian, kind of total pacifist. And Ted was the Unabomber. These two guys who are raised by the same parents in the same place, in the same house. What pushes one this way? One pushes one the other way. I think there's just, I think there's not an easy answer. I think that they grew up in a fairly typical household. I think their parents were what most people would think of as good parents. I think they were, they were involved. There was no violence in the home. I think there was love. Ted certainly disputed that. David thinks there was, so no one else was there. There are moments in Ted's life where you want to say, ah, oh, is this the moment he kind of went off course? And I'm kind of resistant to placing the blame or, or the responsibility for what Ted became on any one thing happening. I think it's such a kind of complicated buildup of lived experience and innate properties and brain chemistry and and all that that i you know i don't i don't have a i don't have a great answer i mean i think part of what i wanted to do in the show was just really dive deep into all of it because too much of the story of ted kaczynski i think had been kind of reduced to these like 
caricatures. This happened to him when he was a baby. This happened to him at Harvard. And thus he became a terrorist. And, and I just, I don't think life is that simple. Just so that people know what you're talking about, the one when he was a baby is the one that his mother, right, thinks might have been the spark that hurt him. Can you quickly just tell us what that was? The first event that happened in Ted Kaczynski's life that has been weighted with this idea of, ah, this is where he started to veer off on a course is when he was a baby, I think he was nine months old, something around there, younger than one. He contracted uh, an illness, had hives. He was hospitalized for a few days. At that time, parents weren't allowed to be with their children 24-7. And his mother, Wanda, said that when Ted, you know, when he went into the hospital, he was this lively, alert, fun baby. And that when he came home a few days later, he was... I think she describes him as a rag doll, and that that formed these trust issues and these fear and paranoia around institutions and technology, and that led to him eventually becoming the Unabomber. The other kind of big event that happened in his life that a lot of people have seen is this moment where you know a kind of alienated guy became a sort of proto-terrorist, is this uh, kind of psychological experiment that he participated in for three years while he was a student at Harvard uh, that was called the Murray Experiment. It was run by a scientist named Henry Murray. And it was an experiment that probably wouldn't be done today. It was somewhat psychologically coercive. And part of the experiment was taking these young men, some of whom had scored very low on a level of kind of being socially comfortable, which is true of Ted. So he kind of came in already feeling alienated. And to, to, he was really torn down in like a number of different sort of experiments and interactions. So see how he could respond to bullying and intense pressure. And he has written that it was psychologically very difficult, but then he has also really resisted, he himself really resisted the idea that the Murray experiment had this lasting damage on him. And I'm also kind of inclined to believe him there. I, I think it's definitely something happened, but the Murray experiment is sort of shrouded in this post-war American military industrial complex mythos. And so I think it's this kind of very appealing idea that that kind of we created the Unabomber. You know, this uh, the, the kind of the monster, it's like, the, it's the Frankenstein story, really. It's that through our ambitions and, science and our inhumanity, we turned this young man into a killer. Yeah. And so I think as a myth, it's kind of appealing. I'm sure it was not a fun experience. I have heard some of the tape. Some of the tape is in the show. To me personally, I think it's quite simplistic to put too much blame on the Murray experiment. One thing that you talk about in the podcast that I didn't know anything about was just how much Ted actually blames his parents and especially his mother for his unhappiness. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, the story of Ted and Wanda, his mother, is the story of this woman trying to reach her son until the very end of her life. And she lived a long time. She died, I think, in 2011. So she got to see the whole Unabomber thing play out and then some reaching out and just being rebuffed in really, really violent ways. You know, he called her a uh, fat pig. When she would send care packages, he would write back these really aggressive notes pointing out that he didn't want this, that, and the other thing, and she did this wrong. And, she's... and, and then he blamed her and his father, but it seems like more of the anger was directed at her for basically all of the kind of social problems that he'd had in his life and said that they didn't care about him. All he meant to them was this kind of token of advancement. You know, they were working class people, children of immigrants, but were also kind of intellectuals. And so the, the fact that Ted was this incredible student, went to Harvard University at 16, became a professor, he decided that his parents had pushed him to do these things, that they didn't actually love him, the person, Ted Kaczynski, they loved the kind of achievements of Ted Kaczynski and what that said about them. But, you know, the letters from Wanda, I will say, like, 
to me reading them just give this really clear indication of a very pure maternal love and she just took so much abuse uh i mean the, the i think the way we end episode 4 is this note i found with my producer at the Michigan archives her last note and usually even ted as a 50 60 year old man who donated these papers was annotating really mean things about his mom on the notes that she sent. This wasn't like at the time. This was Ted sitting in prison, deciding what he wanted the world to read about him for time in memoriam. And he was writing these kind of nasty little asides about his mom. And there's this one last note. It's kind of one line. And she says, I forget exactly what she says, but it's kind of like, Ted, just know that I'll always love you. And it's the one note that he didn't annotate. And it's just then she died a few months later, which I thought was just really, really heartbreaking. The part of your podcast that I was really struck with, and obviously, you know, you're listening to it with a sense of today, right, where there's a lot more conversation about gender dysphoria, sexuality, issues with women, the violence that comes from that. I was quite struck by how complicated Ted's relationship with women were. I was really struck by the fact that you say that, that there was one one moment where he admits that he actually might be transgender, which I had never heard of before. Do you think that listening today, Ted might be considered an incel? Like, are we dealing with that issue? I mean, I think the incel, what an incel is is quite close to a lot of things about Ted Kaczynski. He had wanted to have relationships with women for his entire life and never did. And that desire turned into a real kind of anger and resentment against women. He did write about this moment in graduate school where he had kind of gender dysphoria when he was thinking of pursuing a sex change operation. And then he never talked about it to anyone turned the appointment where he was going to discuss that into an appointment where he complained about anxiety and depression over the possibility of being drafted into the Vietnam War and left that appointment with the total clarity that what he needed to was to murder scientists. So that for him, when he has written about his life, that for him is the moment of the kind of transformation. That's the that's the kind of place where he turns into a alienated guy who's trying to figure things out into a killer. Of course, he doesn't kill for, or doesn't try to kill for quite a bit of time after that. But that's sort of how he's, what he's kind of freighted it with. When I talked to one of the FBI behavioral analysts who had followed Ted for a long time, I brought up the incel idea with her. And she pointed out that one thing that seems different about Ted from kind of incel killers that we've seen is that Ted targeted a lot of people over his years as a terrorist, and he never targeted a woman. This FBI agent that you just mentioned, it's Kathy Puckett, correct? That's right. She seems so different from any other of the FBI agents that you talked to on the case. Tell me a little bit about how she approached the investigation. So Kathy was one of the behavioral analysts who was called in for kind of the final chapter didn't know it was going to be the final chapter, of course, at the time, but was called in a couple of years before Ted was arrested. And while the Unabomber bomb investigation was going on, while she was doing that, she was studying for a PhD in psychology. So she was coming at things very much from a psychological point of view and trying to really understand Ted more than trying to understand the kind of clues and the bombings and the places and the what evidence there was that could lead to the capture of the Unabomber. So she was trying to get into the head of this guy, which I think in a lot of cases is sort of like an exercise in fantasy. I think there are all these profiles that end up being like total BS. Uh, But I think she was able to gain a lot of insight into him And she was one of the people who really pushed for the manifesto to be published, which was the most significant thing that they did in the in the law enforcement operation. And she did that because she thought 
this is a kind of unique mind and this is a mind that has expressed these ideas before someone's going to read it and think that's that's my brother and she was right and the and eventually ted is arrested can you tell me about the end for ted yeah uh after the publication of the manifesto ted was where he had been for the previous two decades in his tiny cabin totally off the grid near lincoln montana once the fbi had heard from david kaczynski that his brother might be the Unabomber, once they had done all the things that they usually did, figure out where this guy had been, how that synced up with the bombings, realized that he could have been the Unabomber, read some of his earlier writing, which sounded very, very similar to Industrial Society and its Future, the manifesto. They did this kind of month and a half long operation stakeout of Ted's cabin, uh, in the winter up high in the mountains in Lincoln, Montana, and eventually got to a place where they felt they needed to move in because word had leaked out to us, to the news media, to journalists, that there was this guy named Ted something with a you know Polish last name high up in Montana, and it was going to be publicized. So they were sort of, their hands were forced and they were able to kind of trick him to open up his door and they just they just literally grabbed him and put him under arrest. I was struck by the description of the cabin and how dirty he was and how dirty the cabin was. Yeah, it was a very, very primitive way of life. And it's as meticulous as Ted was in so many ways. Papers were filed away meticulously, but there was a lot of dirt and grime. And I think another thing that I found super interesting, and this is something I found really just myself going through the archive at the University of Michigan was just how kind of desperate and poor he was by the end. I mean, he was like tracking rations of the rabbits that he killed, you know, how, you know, so that he could stay alive essentially through the winter because he had no money. He was essentially snowed in for a lot of the winter. And it was like this really, really kind of primitive, desperate existence. Like, I hope I hope the snow clears in time so that I can make it to the spring. And this is at the same time, the guy whose writings and demands are part of these super high level discussions in the US government about what are we gonna do with this guy? What are we gonna, and here he is like without a dollar to his name, he gets David to, I think, buy back part of the property just so Ted can have enough money to like, pay the super, super meager taxes on the property to keep it from being repossessed. The life of Ted Kaczynski as a kind of hermit, off the grid person and the life of Ted Kaczynski as a terrorist could not have been farther apart. Tell me about the court case. He, what happens to him when he's finally in custody? Yeah, so he was he was initially actually just detained. He was not arrested because they didn't feel like they had enough evidence to arrest him. So he was detained. Then they were able to search his cabin. So there was a search warrant for his cabin. Then they found essentially the cabin, you know, I think I described it like the, the cabin is basically one big confession. Like the cabin has copies of Industrial Society in its future. The cabin has all of his journals about how he's building bombs and where he's sending them. It, you know, it had a live bomb in it, but they found plenty, plenty of stuff in the, the weeks that they searched his cabin to arrest him. Initially, the government was pursuing the death penalty against him. And there was this kind of long drawn out pretrial proceeding in which he feuded with his lawyers. He tried to fire his lawyers. His lawyers kind of would come back. He had incredible lawyers. They were kind of pushing to pursue a defense strategy that hinged on evidence of mental illness. And Ted did not want that at all. The kind of result of all of the feuding with his lawyers back and forth, and I think a lot of pressure from David Kaczynski. David Kaczynski vehemently did not want the government to pursue the death penalty against Ted. He was uh, strongly anti-death penalty after this case became the executive director of New Yorkers against the death penalty, capital punishment. So he's like, that was his big cause in this. 
And so I think some combination of this trial looking like it was going to be a total mess and David's pressure caused the government to offer him a deal of life in prison and to take the death penalty off the table. And he accepted the deal. So there was there was no trial. The trial was sort of short circuited, I think, two or three minutes into the trial. The judge walks in before anything else can happen. Ted kind of hops up and asks for a pretrial conference. And the result of that a few weeks later was this guilty plea and then a sentence of multiple life terms. Ted died in June of this year. Yeah. There were some writings, some indication that he was ill, but there's also some rumors that he uh, took his own life. Do you know, do you have any idea of what happened? I, I don't know anything anyone else doesn't. Right as we were finishing up the show, there was a letter that Ted sent to someone that was published on Reddit. And in the letter, Ted said that he had terminal cancer and he had been given two years to live. When I saw this, it was kind of brought to my attention I emailed David and I was like, hey, just heads up. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, here's what it says. I think I was the first person to show that to him. He said, I've heard things that Ted might have cancer. And so I was able to kind of discuss Ted's death with David on the podcast, even though obviously Ted hadn't died yet. So David and Ted's father, this actually isn't in the podcast, probably just ends. It's not. It's not private information. Uh, David's written about it. But David and Ted's father had terminal cancer uh, and and took his own life. And so uh, it would not surprise me if if that story, if, if what has kind of been reported, that Ted took his own life facing deteriorating quality of life with uh, with a cancer diagnosis, if that if that is true. So I don't know uh, exactly what happened, but. It definitely wasn't, you know, for the last year since making the show, I've kind of been thinking that this day might come pretty soon. What did you make of his writings and his legacy? You know, it's amazing today, as you mentioned, even in the podcast, the social media generation still quotes him. We still know about this manifesto. What was your opinion about what he said one thing I think about the manifesto is something that I think kind of smart observers of this have been saying since it was published, which is it sounds familiar that the manifesto, this kind of idea that human technology has brought with it a lot of kind of social ills has kind of been around since there's been technology. And so that kind of that idea, I think, has a lot of appeal. And it's been written a lot of times before Ted Kaczynski wrote it. If Industrial Society and its Future had just been published in like a underground journal or even in the Washington Post, and it didn't come with it, the story of a terrorist who had killed three people and sent bombs for 18 years, no no one would talk about it now. I mean, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I don't know who I'm sh- there are probably people who would disagree with that, but like, I don't think most people would. The The writing is inseparable from the act, and the writing kind of takes its power from the acts as well, that the, you can't divorce the writings from the crimes. You know, part, like, part of why I wanted to do the podcast is when I looked at how Ted was viewed now, I thought that there were two kind of competing kind of cartoon versions of Ted. There was the kind of what had been the kind of dominant media law enforcement narrative of Ted, which was the kind of hermit mad bomber, like, whoa, look how crazy this guy is. And then there was, there has been also from the start and it's still around, like this guy was a prophet, man. Look at what he said about technology and it's all coming true. And the thing about the manifesto, I think kind of maybe like the most brilliant thing about the manifesto is it's like open-ended enough that you can look at the manifesto and then you can click over to the front of the New York Times and you can say, look, it's all happening. Wildfires in Canada, AI, existential threat, AI is going to turn against us. There's that kind of caricature of Ted as this kind of prophet. The reason I think in the show, 
I ended up playing it pretty straight and focusing just on the kind of mostly on the story of Ted Kaczynski is I thought kind of like the, the person Ted Kaczynski had been lost and there wasn't a lot of energy being paid to how and why he ended up becoming who he was. And that was really what I wanted to tackle in the show. Well, you did. It was great. Thanks. You've been listening to Crime Story from CBC Podcasts. You can get our next episode a week early on CBC Podcasts' YouTube channel or by subscribing to CBC Podcasts' Apple True Crime channel. Next week, I'll be talking to Sarah Trelevin about her podcast, Madness of Two, and how the perfect soccer mom became a convicted murderer. Part of the reason that people were so obsessed with this story is she bucked all expectations for what we believe a mother is supposed to be. In addition to early access, subscribers to our True Crime channel also listen ad-free. Crime Story is written and hosted by me. Our producers are Alexis Green and Sarah Clayton. Sound design by Graham McDonald. Our senior producer is Jeff Turner. Our video producer is Evan Agard. Our YouTube producer is John Lee. Additional audio from 60 Minutes, ABC, Fox, and Warner Music Group. Executive producers are Cecil Fernandez and Chris Oak. Tanya Springer is CBC Podcast Senior Manager, and Arif Narani is the Director of CBC Podcasts.